Today at the National Press Club, Australian Christian Lobby's managing director Martin Isles debates National Secular Lobby of Australia Ambassador Fiona Patton over the government's draft religious freedom bill. Martin Isles and Fiona Patton with today's National Press Club debate. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the National Press Club of Australia and today's Westpac Address. My name is Sabra Lane. I am the club's president. We have something special for you today, a debate about religious freedom or the, the government's uh, Religious Discrimination Act, which it hopes to pass Parliament by the end of this year. To discuss that, we're joined by Martin Isles, the Managing Director of the Australian Christian Lobby, and Fiona Patton, a Victorian MP, but also an ambassador with the National Secular Lobby. Now, we have some rough rules in place. Each speaker will have six minutes to address you on their case. There'll be one ring of the bell at 30 seconds close to time and then another two gongs at the end of time. Each speaker will then have two minutes to directly answer a question put to them. The other speaker will also have an opportunity to rebut of about one minute in length. Each speaker will also have the opportunity during today's address to ask two questions of the other, and that will be at my discretion as to when that occurs. To the audience here at the Press Club, we do pride ourselves on the fact that we are the home of informed debates, and we ask that applause be left to the end of answers. That makes it much easier for those following at home to hear what is actually happening here up on stage. And if you'd like to participate in the discussion online, you can find us at Twitter. Our user handle is at Press Club, AUST, and our hashtag is NPC. Now, we've tossed a coin, and opening today's proceedings is Martin Isles. Thank you. Thank you. I'm here to speak in favour of the concept of religious freedom because it is something that is intrinsically human. Humans wonder. They ponder the meaning of life, they ask ultimate questions, and they live in the light of them. That's the human story. It's been happening for millennia, it's happening today. And religious freedom is the protection of that human aspiration to understand and to live accordingly. There's nothing more human than that. And in that freedom, actually, is true diversity, because that freedom accommodates actual difference. People who actually disagree, who actually have different views on ultimate purpose and meaning, who actually do live differently to each other. Our own High Court has said freedom of religion, the paradigm freedom of conscience, is the essence of a free society. And there's something in that, because there's countless societies around our world and in history that have had limited religious freedom, and none of them have been good places to live. So religious freedom is good. It's the hallmark of a free society, it's the hallmark of diversity, it's the hallmark of human rights. And I'm grateful to live in Australia where freedom of religion has long been a key principle of our democracy. But my support for the particular aims of this bill, the Religious Discrimination Bill 2019, is grounded in a more practical concern. In 2016, myself and some others started a law firm, or it is now a law firm, the Human Rights Law Alliance, designed to give legal support to those who need it for living out their faith. And I remember saying to a colleague at the time that actually it's the first business model I've had anything to do with that entails failure being success, because we don't want that to be a need. Unfortunately, that firm has gone from strength to strength and has had dozens and dozens of cases. I'll give you a couple of examples today. There is, for example, Anthony, a university student who had peers that shared things with him from time to time because he's a personable guy. And one of the things he used to do with their permission was pray for them. Anthony had a complaint against him from a young lady who he prayed for with her permission because she was struggling with depression. The university, as a result of talking to Anthony, uh, ended up suspending him for a period of six months pending review, ended up uh, saying that he would have to be involved in fortnightly counselling classes to learn how to interact with his peers, ended up saying that uh, uh, he would uh, not be able to speak about his religion openly on campus and he had discipline recorded on his academic record. I didn't believe that either when I heard about it, but it was true when we investigated. <coughs> or Melissa, a medical doctor with 40 years of experience. She's a leader in her field which covers gender and sexuality issues. She's a Christian. She was asked to speak in some Christian schools about these concerns. She gave those talks which were rigorously academic but which were also Christian in worldview. Somebody saw those talks, stalked her for a while, assaulted her in her local shops, but also reported her to a university where she had an academic status and a professional body with which she had an accreditation. 
she lost that accreditation. The university, with substantial legal support for her, preserved her academic status, but not without a stern warning. Or Chris and Mary are foster parents. They applied to be respite carers for foster children under the age of six. Now, they went through the foster agency's uh, selection programs and they passed with flying colours and the relationship was great. They fully expected to be enrolled in that program until they had to do one more workshop, which was about sexual orientation, gender identity issues. As Christians, they filled out that workshop as best they could and there was nothing particularly controversial about it as Christian people. Uh, but of course they said, well, this workshop was completely irrelevant, and it was in its terms, to children under the age of six. However, they received a decision notice off the back of that that they had failed the criteria of creating a safe home environment for children and they would decline the right to be foster parents. Another is Andrew, who is a professional who relies on accreditation for his livelihood and career. He's a political conservative and a Christian. And a relevant qualifying body started an investigation against Andrew without him ever knowing about it. It went on for a period of months and he didn't find out until they wrote to him to say that his professional accreditation had been cancelled and that he would have just a mere matter of days to make an answer to a tribunal to try and defend it. He failed. His livelihood is now at threat. These are not the most grievous examples. These are relatively normal examples. These are examples that this bill could help to protect. And I remember saying when we were embroiled in the Israel Folau issue, it's great that we've got someone who's famous who is suffering in this way, but actually what Israel Folau did was high-level conduct compared to what most of our clients usually do. It's usually far less controversial than that. And protecting religious freedom is a good thing because it sends a message to every bureaucrat, to every politician who has accrued a little bit of power to themselves, that they cannot simply finish people. They can't ruin their careers and do harm to them simply because they don't like what they have said. And we speak consistently with people who work in government departments, people who work in institutions, people who work under the supervision of qualifying bodies, and they say they're concerned about their future because their beliefs are not welcome in the workplace and their concerns are usually substantive in nature. They have some reason for feeling that way. It's not just imagined. That sense is rising, not shrinking. And of course, I personally have an interest in this bill because I am a Christian. I believe in Jesus Christ, sin, salvation, judgment, eternal hope, evangelism, and all the pillars of my conviction, and I seek to live consistent with them. I am one of those people I described at the start who wonders, thinks, and lives. These are my life. They always will be. And I don't think that anybody should ever be discriminated against for that simple fact. Thank you. Thank you. Fiona Patton. Uh, thank you. As many of you know, before I became a politician, I spent decades fighting against censorship of adult media. Censorship that was vehemently supported by the Australian Christian lobby. So I'm always a little bit sceptical when they present themselves as defenders of free speech, as they're trying to do with the Religious Discrimination Bill. But having said that, I agree. We should protect against discrimination on the basis of religious belief. Freedom of and freedom from religion are the cornerstones of a society that celebrates diversity and advocates for tolerance and mutual respect. I believe in religious freedom and free speech. Both are crucial to a free society. However, the Religious Discrimination Bill does not foster tolerance. It doesn't foster mutual respect. In fact, it does the opposite. It positively allows for people to publicly and loudly express opinions that are cruel, intolerant and disrespectful. And to be frank, after reading the bill, as well as numerous submissions, expert assessments and statements made by many religious organisations, who were part of the drafting process. And I have to say there was no secular organisations that were invited to be part of that process, including the National Secular uh, Lobby. But after all of that, I'm confident that the motivation for this bill was never about protection from discrimination, but rather the enabling of discrimination. Remarkably, this bill establishes a right to override 
all state and territory anti-discrimination laws. It even overrides existing federal laws, including the Race Discrimination and Sex Discrimination Acts. So how could this possibly be considered a protection from discrimination bill when it overrides all protections that currently exist? Martin has said that the bill gives and the bill takes away. He believes that it does not give religious people enough freedom. Well, even Philip Ruddock's review found that there was no systemic religious discrimination in Australia, and in fact, that religious freedom in Australia is actually pretty healthy. Religious organisations have so much freedom, including the freedom not to pay tax, and not because they're doing something charitable, but for the simple reason that they are promoting religion. I'm talking about commercial businesses like Catholic Insurance and Sanitarium. Now, Section 41, which has been described as the revenge of the Marriage Equality Act, expressly overrides the and every anti-discrimination statute in the country and officially establishes the right to be a bigot. That's right. All laws that make it unlawful to discriminate on the grounds of religion will be overridden. The practical effect of this will be to give people a positive right to make a statement of belief that may insult, offend, intimidate, ridicule or humiliate anyone on any ground. The only caveat is that the discriminatory statement must reasonably be regarded as being in accordance with their religious beliefs. But perversely and probably unconstitutionally, the bill does not grant the right to be vile equally. For non-religious people, the bill only protects statements that, make, that may arise directly from their lack of religious beliefs. In a nutshell, an atheist can only make discriminatory statements that are related to religion. So the only insulting remarks that a non-religious person can make is to and about people with religious beliefs. For religious people, statements of belief on any topic are protected under the law. It allows for people on the grounds of their beliefs to insult, offend, ridicule or humiliate anyone widely and publicly and even in the workplace. As Napoleon the pig said in Animal Farm, some are more equal than others. Section 41 also covertly overrides our occupational health and safety laws to permit, for example, a male, Mormon, Muslim or Catholic employer to tell a female worker that women should not be in a position of leadership over men. The bill also has the practical effect of giving health practitioners a right to refuse health services if the refusal is motivated by their religious belief. Consider a midwife refusing to deliver a single mother's baby, a rural pharmacist refusing to fill a teenage girl's prescription for the pill, or a Christian nurse simply refusing to treat a Muslim. Bizarrely, the bill does not offer non-religious health practitioners the same right to refuse treatment, even though they may hold the same beliefs. I think I'm in the majority in saying that access to good health care should never be trumped by religious beliefs. The bill is so broad that it extends to overriding any existing or future law that stands in the way of allowing people to make these statements of belief and refuse services because of them. So, for example, there's some safe access legislation around the country that protects, um, protects women going to abortion clinics from being harassed, intimidated or um, humiliated. It's not out of the question that those laws would be overridden under this bill, nor is it out of the question that laws that prevent workplace bullying may be also be overridden. As Martin once said himself, albeit about voluntary assisted dying, Australia must not become the kind of society where some lives are considered worthier of life than others. Why indeed then, Martin, would you have that religious views should be more worthy than secular bill views? The bill places the right of religious beliefs at the top of a hierarchy of human rights. The bill enshrines religious belief and sets religious faith on a pedestal that it demonstrably does not deserve. Thank you very much, Fiona. We'll go to questions from the floor in a moment, but Martin, first a question to you. What do you feel um, that you can't say now that you want legal protection for? Well, the answer can be seen in all of the cases that we've dealt with. Um, you have a lot of people who are seeking legal protection 
uh, for whether it be the presence of Christian materials on their desk, whether it be uh, praying for somebody, as the first case that I described. Um, there are certainly hot button issues. Uh, there are those matters of deep disagreement. So where you get people who are effectively talking about um, their views on things like marriage, gender and sexuality, which by the way is not a fringe or a crank view, um, those are views held by about 5 million Australians based on the poll. Uh, all of those people, which is the public, uh, are facing difficulty in that area. So those are hot button <coughs> views that tend to attract uh, concern. Also life is a hot button issue that attends to, uh, in, uh, tends to attract concern. Um, but also, sometimes it is just plain old religion. There are people out there who we know of right now who are told they cannot at all express any of their religious beliefs in the workplace, full stop. Um, there is an anti-religious element here, and that's why this is a helpful bill. Um, and I would say this, Fiona's premise isn't right because she has a pro uh, elimination of vilification bill before the Victorian Parliament right now, which sets a less restrictive standard than this bill. It says comments that are likely to vilify uh, are not allowed. This bill says the same thing. Comments that are likely to vilify are not allowed or likely to harass, lower standard. Or malicious, lower standard. And not made in good faith, lower standard. And so this bill permits less in terms of speech and has more controls on it in terms of speech than Fiona's own standard. Uh, and so it isn't a license for bigotry. Uh, that simply betrays the fact that we are now calling bigotry anything we don't like. And in this case, it's religion. This is not bigotry. This is a very confined and narrow exemption on what you can and cannot say. Fiona, would you like a chance to rebut yes, that? Yeah, th thank you, Sabra, and, and thank you. Um, I, th I think let's just be clear. Vilification laws and discrimination laws are entirely separate. Vilification is around inciting an action inciting an action against, uh, to, to violence, inciting an action. So we have vilification legislation in every state in Australia. This legislation overrides the anti-discrimination legislation. So that is what it gives right to people who hold religious beliefs to insult, offend, humiliate, ridicule and intimidate. Those are the, those is what is already protected in our existing state anti-discrimination laws that this legislation will override and enable people to make, as I say, really cruel statements. And just on malicious, you've got, if you've got a religious belief, then it can't be malicious. First Can question. I, one minute reply. Sorry. Yep. I just want to say very quickly, um, this bill would not override the elimination of vilification of Bill Victoria. Um, it just wouldn't, because the standard is, is, is less restrictive. So, Don't mm. Commonwealth bi bills override state if there's a conflict? Well, they do, but what I'm saying is that the stand there's no conflict, because the standard right. that is set by the Victorian legislation is, in fact, a standard that is, more res that is uh, less restrictive than the Religious Discrimination Bill. And so what that means is there is nothing that would be licensed under the Religious Discrimination Bill that is not licensed under the elimination of vilification bill, so there would never be any conflict. Uh -huh. So you would actually use the vilification bill, it would, it would restrict less. <laughs> Sorry, just to, just to clarify, I have, I have put up a private member's bill that seeks to bring the Victorian legislation into line with, the, with all other vilification legislation around Australia, New South Wales, Queensland, Tasmania, etc. Um, however, that is a private member's bill. The existing racial and religious tolerance Act in Victoria could sets up vilification, and it could very well um, be overridden by this federal bill. All right, we're going to move on. Paul Carp. Paul Carp from Guardian Australia. Uh, could I please ask uh, first to Martin? Christian groups have criticised the bill, including the Catholic Church, who wants more hiring and firing powers, and the Sydney Anglican Church, which has gone a step further and said it can't support it in its current form because it would allow Satanists to hire their campsites, among many other objections. You said you support the aims of the bill, um, but can I ask, is it acceptable in its current form, or do you share those concerns? And to Fiona, uh, Christian Porter is looking for an acceptable middle ground uh, out of a lot of 
stakeholders uh, with problems with the bill. Is that middle ground possible if the override of discrimination law and the um, conscientious, uh, conscientious objection to medical procedures is left in? Um, so, uh, to going to, where, to what extent I support the bill in its current form, um, most of the amendments that I'd like made to the bill are simply to simplify it. Uh, so, for example, you have some places where there's ten legal tests instead of one, or four is probably more accurate than one. Uh, one is the one I just mentioned before. So you say, well, it can't be speech that's likely to vilify, it can't be speech that's likely to harass, it can't be speech that's malicious, it can't be speech that's not in good faith. And you sit there and you go, well, why don't you just get one test that, that settles that? A judge is going to spend 50 pages writing up his opinion, trying to meander his way through those. It needs clarifying. Another one is, uh, you know, um, if they make... Uh, if someone can uh, make uh, a reasonable... If, if, if a religious belief is, 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 uh, is reasonable and it's reasonably in accordance with the doctrine's tenets, beliefs of a particular religion is made in good faith and again you get this multi-layered you notice some of those sections are really long um, and I'm just like look why don't they just say a belief that's consistent with your religion and, 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 and cut out all of that meandering the word salad effectively uh, that they've put in there so that's my main uh, concern um, I would say um, uh, on the I don't know anything about the Anglican point that you raised and I'm just racking my brains for what what that would be referring to. But uh, on the Catholic point, which is that they do want to be able to ensure the integrity of their institutions, um, uh, this is uh, the rights that religious groups have, uh, although they're not particularly clearly articulated and therefore they want them more clearly articulated, in relation to saying, uh, look, we want to ensure that we can uphold the religious integrity of our institution, is not unusual, it's not special privilege. It's the same right that anybody has if they have a religious or a political purpose because their purpose for existing is to make religious differences and is to make political differences. So it therefore is nonsensical to say that they can't discriminate on those grounds. Of course they can. That's why they are there. And the same assumption doesn't apply in the community at large. And I'll say this, um, political parties enjoy exactly the same right. There, are, there is actually an exemption in the Victorian Equal Opportunity Act that allows Fiona Patton's political party, the Reason Party, and all political parties to ensure the ideological integrity of their party by employing people who share their beliefs. Fiona? Um, I believe that the, the, the bill... Uh, in answering to your question, David, rather than responding to, yeah, to this right. one, yes, that was yes. About I, I think there are some possible yeah. solutions, and as and as I had said at the start, I, I support um, anti-discrimination legislation that protects people's religious beliefs or lack thereof. And so, I would say that some of the solutions would be to amend the bill so that it doesn't override existing anti-discrimination legislation in all states. Uh, I certainly think Section 41 should be deleted. Uh, that gives this sort of un, un, you know, unfair and um, unfair right of religious people to, to, uh, to offend people uh, where it doesn't give the same right to non-religious people. And we could also bring the, um, and I think this may help with Martin's statements as well, bring definitions of religious belief into line with existing federal anti-discrimination laws. So this bill actually goes, moves away from that. I would say also in looking at the workplace and in looking at the, the concerns about employers being able to direct what an employee says outside the workplace, uh, why don't we have an inquiry into this? Why don't we look at this? And I think this would be something that we could have an inquiry into and see how it might fit into the Fair Work Act and that it would cover all employees, not just employees with a religious belief. Can I direct a question to both of you? There are people who are concerned, people who work in Christian organisations who feel that if this bill passed, um, they're gay, that it would give their employers easy licence to dismiss them. Can you both address that point? They're right. It could. It absolutely could. And also, when you look at what Section 41 does, which Section 41, which says that if you make a statement of religious belief that you reasonably is in line with your tenets and doctrines and is, you know, reasonably engaged with your religion, then you can make that statement that could be just absolutely discriminatory. If that person was to challenge that under state anti-discrimination law, that statement could not be included in that case. 
so that person would be discriminated against and actually could lose their job for it and would find it very difficult to run an anti-discrimination case in a state in a state jurisdiction and in actual fact would have to run it in the federal jurisdiction and then you come back to section 41 um, it overriding uh, all other anti-discrimination legislation so yes we are completely we are left with the ability for people um, who are gay and lesbian to be not only harassed at work but actually sacked from work uh, they will also you know we will see this type of I think really vile and cruel behavior possibly become commonplace because it is allowed and that this legislation basically says that Australians should have the right to be bigots. Now that's not the Australia that I actually want to live in. I actually want to live in an, in a, in an Australia that is respectful of other people, that recognise the diversity in our, in our society. That whether that's different religions, whether that's sexuality, whether that's gender, whether that's marital status, whatever. Um, but this bill does is so broad that even a person with disability could be affected by this because, as I say, it overrides all state discrimination legislation. Um, with the hiring and firing stuff, um, it's important that there should be no surprises. Um, so if somebody, for example, is working as a staffer for the Greens, um, there's no surprises for them when if they go and they really promote um, you know, the Adani coal mine and then they start um, you know, talking about how the, you know, marriage is one man and one woman to the exclusion of all others for life. There's no surprise for that person when their supervisor comes along and says, Oi, you're possibly in the wrong place. Uh, we have a party manifesto um, and that's our, our right. Uh, and it's exactly the same in, in a religious institution. Uh, every religious group that I have ever come across uh, has a statement of faith. Uh, we have a statement of faith at ACL. And when you come to work for us, you look at that statement and you go through the list and you go, yeah, actually I'm very happy to abide by uh, this set of beliefs in my life. And you tick it off. And the only circumstances under which you would be challenged in that would be if you, if you breach the standard. Uh, and if there's, no, um, if there's no agreement made beforehand, uh, then fine, I understand why uh, an institution shouldn't, shouldn't be able to fire somebody for an agreement that wasn't made um, and an agreement that wasn't legitimate in light of their overall purpose uh, and objectives. Um, I also think um, this assumption that somebody who is religious being able to make a statement of belief uh, is, is, is bigot, bigoted uh, and stating bigotry uh, is one of the issues we really need to resolve um, because you can't have bigotry, you can't have hate speech without motive. You can't have hate speech without hate. You can't have bigotry without actual um, vehement intolerance. Um, and in most cases, these people have no such intention. And I don't know of any other laws, well, there's very few other laws uh, in existence, where you can actually be convicted of something where you don't intend it, uh, where you can be convicted of something where there's no causation between what you say and actual identifiable harm, uh, and also where there is no harm that's been identified. Um, these laws simply say, no, you can't say certain things and we'll assume why you said them. And I think that anti-discrimination laws and vilification laws therefore send a very bad message uh, about a harmonious society. So, so just, I, I think, just to quickly respond, um, the, the, the Australian Christian Lobby, the, the, the Catholic Church and many other orga religious organisations have called for this legislation to be expanded into their commercial businesses. So when you consider that 40% of aged care today is provided by religious organisations and that we are going to extend this ability to hire and fire and this insistence that anyone who works in that aged care um, has the same beliefs as that religious organisation, I think this does become very dangerous and it does become extremely exclusive. And then how does that affect um, the patients and the people in those, um, those aged care facilities, if they also have different beliefs to the, to the aged care um, organisation. I think this is I incredibly dangerous and very divisive. Quick chance to rebut that and then we'll take the next question. Oh, look, only to say that we seem to forget 30% of Australians said they're not religious on the last census. Uh, the rest actually chose to pass that box and decide that they are in fact religious. So the Australian public is religious. Um, that's just a matter of fact. And so if there are institutions that serve the religious people in our communities, 
even if there's quite a few, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. And I think there's a concern here uh, that I think there's a lot of people who just resent the idea that the Australian public is a, is a public of faith. Uh, and I travel this country length and breadth all the time. And I come across teeming thousands of people who are people of sincere faith. And they want to go to a faith-based nursing home. They want to go to a faith-based uh, school. Uh, and there is a plethora of options out there. And so there should be. And if a lot of them are religious, that's fine. Simon Gross. Uh, Simon Gross from Canberra IQ. I've got a, a two-part question that goes to wider context. Uh, mm. I learnt a lot, but I learnt something when I went to the National Gallery a few months ago. Uh, it was a Captain Cook exhibition. And um, I learnt that Catholicism was illegal in Britain up till about the 1820s, which surprised me because I thought that was like so far back. So I, I wonder if you could both reflect on the historical context of the current mm. debate we've got now. Uh, secondly, I haven't heard anybody in this debate cite a foreign jurisdiction that has a regime that they would endorse or they would see as a model. Do you have any, any offerings there? Yep. <clears throat> Two minutes each to answer those questions. Um, Fiona, do you actually okay. want to go first? Uh, th thank you. Um, I, I don't know of any... Uh, well, I, I actually think that our anti-discrimination legislation in Australia actually does find the balance. You know, it provides, I think, some very generous exceptions uh, that I probably wouldn't agree with. But I do think that, generally speaking, our anti-discrimination legislation, our anti-vilification legislation, is used appropriately um, in this country. You know, it's interesting that we look at the fact that Catholicism was outlawed, um, you know, in the United Kingdom, and that is why we have a constitution that is so fiercely secular. That is why we have a constitution that says no religion should be treated uh, with, greater, with, with, um, with greater privilege than another. And yet this is exactly what this legislation will do. This treats people with certain beliefs, religious beliefs, differently and unfairly to people who do not have religious beliefs. And Martin's right. 30% of us don't have religious beliefs. But out of the 40% of people who say that they are religious um, and they are Christian, they put religion pretty much at the bottom of their list, behind family, behind relationships, behind their work, behind their leisure, even behind their politics. So we know that, the, that this, this bill will probably only affect very few people who will take up the right to make statements that insult, humiliate, offend um, and, her, and, um, uh, and offend people. Um, however, it will affect the many that are on the receiving end of that vile statement and of the discrimination that, that it attracts. Martin? Um, in answer to the first question, um, I think history has a lot to teach us. Uh, about these matters. Uh, what happens when, as I said before, people who have accrued some power to themselves uh, in whatever their sphere decide that they will be the arbiter of what can and can't be said, for example, or what can and can't be believed. I don't know of many examples of that in history that don't result in injustice. Um, and uh, you're quite right, there has been in, uh, in our history even, uh, but also uh, in English history, uh, an injustice against Catholics. Um, and they were denied certain privileges and they were denied, I mean, there was, a, there was I think, Catholic education uh, had fewer, um, a fewer opportunities than Protestant education. I can't remember the details, I was talking to someone about it the other day. But those sorts of things uh, are unjust. And I guess the, the liberal democratic ideal has, has been to try and, as best as we can, uh, learn to live together in freedom with great and deep differences. Um, and if you don't have that, I'm not sure to what extent we are better than those in history who have... Uh, here's the thing. Many of the, many of the people I encounter today who want to uh, close down people's faith and their sincere statements of their faith are people without religion. Um, but just because they are in a historical minority where uh, they live by effectively the product of their mind and their convictions without an outside power, um, doesn't mean they're any better than those who did perpetuate religious bigotry in the past. And there's lessons in history for both sides. There's lessons in history for us not to perpetuate that kind of bigotry, but also uh, to ensure, for, uh, from either side, uh, and to work together towards actually dealing with difference well. 
Okay. Can, can I just make a quick comment then, Martin? I, I'd just like to pick up on um, the fact uh, around the religious organisations, and I, and I, I do note that the Uniting Church, um, which is a significant organisation in Australia, actually doesn't agree. They actually think this legislation does establish the right to be a bigot. They think this legislation sets the harm bar way too high. And so for them, from, as, as, as believers and people with a religious background, they also don't support this. And I think when I speak to many people who do have a religious belief, they also don't feel that they, have, that they need to use that belief to insult or humiliate people. Do you want a quick chance to rebut that? Um, sure. I mean, the Uniting Church is a denomination. Um, there's dozens of denominations in Australia. Um, and I find the Uniting Church is, is always the go-to um, for dissenting views on these issues. Um, the reality is most Australian church attending Christians are not going to the Uniting Church uh, and they think differently. Now, I talk to more Christians from more denominations in this country than anybody. Uh, I can say that without a doubt and I can tell you for sure uh, that most of them think that this bill's a good idea. Um, uh, something else I was going to say which has gone out of my head. Um, Never mind, I'll save it up. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay, save it up. We're going to take the first of our questions to each of you. So, Martin, your question to Fiona. I don't have one actually at this stage. No, I'm good. <laughs> oh, okay. Yep. Look, we'll uh, hand pass straight away yeah, to Fiona. Yeah, Fiona, you well, go first. Well, well, thank you, um, Martin. I think one of the um, one of the areas that uh, that I've sort of I think I've, I've spoken about is the the imbalance between I think what we're seeing is the privilege of those with the religious belief over the people who who don't have a religious belief. And so one option would be to set that bar um, evenly so that those without a belief could, could make similar statements on, on any range of things. At the moment, this bill limits non-religious people um, to override the Discrimination Act only on the grounds of religion. Would you support making uh, it an even? It's funny you ask that, because as I threw to you, I had a thought <laughs> for a very similar question, uh, which is effectively that... Uh, if there were to be a broader freedom of speech type proposal, which didn't just say statements of belief for people who have a religious faith, I think that would be better. I, I really do. Um, I'm, I'm not out here to say, oh yes, religious people should say things that others are not allowed to say. Uh, I absolutely think that everybody should be treated precisely the same way. Uh, in that respect. Um, and so if we're talking about a, you know, I've often, I have these utopian dreams sometimes about what we could do if we could just start all over. Um, and one of the things we could do is, is a Restoration of Freedoms Act. Um, but I would prefer instead to amend those laws that I think overreach, um, mm. because I'm a minimalist in that regard. But yes, um, uh, for me, uh, I think broader freedom-based stuff, obviously with qualifications and carve-outs, carve yeah. I'm in favour. Right. Um, have you come up with another question, or do you want me to take it to the floor? I kind of like the fact that we agree with each other. No, you're <laughs> Excellent. Our next question, Amy Greenbank. Amy Greenbank here from the ABC. One for Martin Isles. Yeah. What do you make of business concerns that this bill will spark conflict in the workplace, that it will undermine employers' ability to protect their workers from harassment, or even promote the superiority of religious views of others? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I read that article yesterday. Um, uh, there were some errors in the article, uh, I mean, in, in what they were saying about the bill. Um, but here's the thing. This bill applies to employers who are corporates who make more than $50 million in revenue a year, and that's it. Uh, and one of the disagreements I had not mentioned previously um, was that I don't think that that's a, a reasonable restriction. Uh, that needs to... Either this is a right to speak or it's not. Uh, and if it is, it's not just big employers that we're worried about. We're worried about public servants. A lot of our cases are public servants uh, and, um, and others. And one of the things said in that article yesterday um, was that these big businesses were concerned that they may have people of religious beliefs who don't believe in diversity and therefore it would stop them. And I'm sitting there going, well, hang on, what do you think diversity is if it's not a diversity of opinions? if it's not a diversity of people who disagree with each other. Um, and I'm not shedding a tear, really, for a big corporate who actually thinks that in an employee's private life, away from work, they should have any right at all to control what the opinions are that they give um, in their conversations and on their social media. They're not their slaves. You know, it's not serfs and masters. 
uh, we are dealing with individuals who want to be their whole selves in their lives. Uh, and yeah, they work for an employer and their employer might think they're the biggest, uh, you know, biggest kid on the block and you know, has all the control over them and, and that their whole life is sold out to serving the employer. That's just not true. It just isn't true. So I have very little sympathy for that um, point of view and I'd say that they have portrayed a very serious misunderstanding of what diversity actually is uh, because all they need to do is put out a statement and say we disagree with that person but hey, it's a free world. Uh, just quickly, I, I think what's interesting and you know, certainly listening to Martin because I, you have all, Martin has also called that it be extended to all businesses, so not just those big corporates at 50 million, but the legislation excludes religious organisations from this. So religious organisations could actually fire someone for saying something that they didn't agree with or that was opposed to the tenets of that organisation if they said that outside. So they are carved out of this legislation. This would allow, you know, I mean, it would allow me, I suppose, to walk past uh, someone in my workplace and, and, and mock and insult the, the little shrine to the Virgin Mary or something that they had on their, on their desk. It would enable, as I'd said, an employer to say, women should not, sh women should always be subordinate to men. And, um, and that would be allowed. I, I don't think that that enables diversity. I don't think that enables safe and good workplaces. A reply? Um, just real quick, um, the first problem with the examples given was that Fiona said in the workplace. This law doesn't apply in the workplace. It only applies in your private life. Um, and also, none of those things done in someone's private life are currently unlawful. So, it doesn't make a difference. David Spears. Yeah, David Spears uh, from Sky News. Thank you both for the debate today. Can I just pick up on that very point? Mm -hmm. um, because this seems to be a, a real point of disagreement. It comes back to what Sabra was asking about earlier. Uh, so a couple of things. Uh, Fiona, you do believe this law would make it legal to sack someone for being gay. Uh, Martin, can I just clear up, is that your understanding of the law and are you okay with that in any circumstance? And, and similarly, is it, does it also allow if you're Mormon or Muslim, I think you said, Fiona, that you, you could sack someone or, 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 or not promote someone um, because women shouldn't be in a position of leadership over men. Is that what this law would allow? Can I just get some clarity on whether that's your understanding of the draft law and are you okay with that, Martin? Uh, look, there is a Christian sexual ethic um, which a lot of people find upsetting. Uh, and the Christian sexual ethic is that uh, sexual relations are for one man to one woman in the union of marriage as Christianly understood to the exclusion of all others for life. And all of these Christian organisations, if, so, if I, for example, working for my organisation, slept with someone on the weekend, they'd fire me. Um, and that's because that's, the, that's what Christians believe, that's what Christians do. And um, it's a Christian sexual ethic that's held by a lot of people in this country. And it concerns me. And, and so... The answer is, if somebody was to engage in a behaviour that's outside of that uh, and therefore undermine the purpose of the organisation and its promotion of the Christian faith, uh, then, much like a person in a political party betraying a false ideology to the politics of the party, then there would be a right there, absolutely. Um, it concerns me, though, when this thing is always... Ra it's always raised, as if that there is a a one-eyed obsession with the LGBT community, that, that Christians somehow have this special vendetta uh, where it's the LGBT community that's always going to be excluded. Uh, and nothing could be further from the truth. Um, the Christian teaching, and this came up in the Israel Folau stuff all the time, the Christian teaching on this is that every single one of us is a sinner, that we are not okay. Uh, and that's a, a teaching that's embraced by so many people because it, it has trappings of truth about it. I'm in the generation that was told how special I was for you know, all my life and how I was you know, to pursue whatever my dreams were and I'm beautiful and you know, it's my destiny just to be me and follow myself. And you know, there's a lot of people out there that go, I'm not sure that people are okay. I'm not sure that people aren't drastically flawed. Uh, and yes, part of that is a sexual ethic. And um, uh, to say that people are going to be judged and, you know, and it doesn't stop there. Christianity is a message of ultimate hope where every single person who says, who's told they're not okay, is told there is certainty and assurance of absolute redemption and salvation. And you don't even need to be concerned that that's not true. So if you don't believe uh, the salvation, you don't believe the condemnation, so it shouldn't really be an issue. But if Christians want to be Christian, 
uh, in any area like that should be perfectly fine to do so and they're not unduly biased. Thank you. I, I, I think going for Martin's answer, you, you, we, we have a very clear answer on that, yes. And when you look at how Section 41 may operate in, in discrimination, so imagine the circumstance where um, a, 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 a senior person who has strong religious beliefs about the subordination of women and the fact that no woman should be able to have any power over men and that women should, would, should sit in a subordinate and secondary position. And that person's applying, and, that, and a woman applies for a promotion in that job. And he says to that woman, I don't think women should ever take on leading roles and I don't think ever they should be the boss of men. Um, and surprise, surprise, she doesn't get the promotion. Now, she may quite rightly consider that it was because of his belief that no woman, no man should be subordinate to women that, he did, that she didn't get the job. So when she takes that as a discrimination case, the fact that he can now use section, could use section 41 to say, well, that was my belief, that's my religious belief, and that is what my religion tells me, that women are subordinate to men. She has no case if this legislation goes through. Um, like I said before, there should be no surprises. If somebody gets a job in a, in a particular place, it should be absolutely clear what the beliefs are and there shouldn't be, a, shouldn't be a shock. However, I've read through some of the examples like Fiona's now and I think it was Luke Beck wrote a piece the other day that said a doctor could tell a patient that a disability is a result of sin. I'm like, what do you people think Christians believe? Like, seriously? <laughs> what organisation <laughs> is like, well, women can't have any position of leadership at all? Is that a... It's not... I don't know what people think we believe. There's, there's crazy ideas out there uh, <laughs> where this is simply not the case, except for in some actual churches. Uh, and if you were a member of that actual church, yeah. you'd know precisely what was going on. Uh, and so this is not something that's out there in the public. And also... I do actually struggle to understand what the relevance of this is to section 41, because section 40 or 42, it, it, only, it only relates to statements of belief not being infringing of state vilification laws, and it sets a tighter standard than the state vilification laws. So it really has nothing to do with what we've just been talking about. It, it has everything to do with it. Absolutely everything. Um, if you can't, if you've got a statement of belief, and certainly there would, there, we would, we could use the disability um, uh, example. And yes, that might be very rare that there would be a religious organisation that would have a religious belief. But they only have to be reasonably be regarded as being in accordance with their religious belief, and they can make that statement. And that statement cannot be used in any discrimination claim. Um, because that statement is exempt from all state discrimination legislation. That is, it's not relevant to vilification legislation and that, and that is separate legislation. We are talking about discrimination legislation in this case. I can quote the section. <laughs> Sounds like I can quote we it. disagree on that particular point. We'll take our next question, Mark Kenny. Uh, Mark Kenny from the uh, Press Club board, also from the ANU. Um, I have, I'm yet to hear any compelling reason why we're even having this debate, why we're even having this push forward for this law. This, the, the, the list of uh, examples that you gave, Martin, at the uh, beginning uh, seemed to me to be uh, pretty marginal cases. They were one-sided versions of it. I'm sure if we looked into the uh, transcripts of those uh, proceedings, we'd find that uh, you know, the other side had a particular view about it. It wasn't simply that someone had prayed for someone and that was that. Um, you can defend that argument if you like, but if that is the strength of the argument for this, then I'm wondering why the government is wasting so much time on trying to deliver rights that, uh, that uh, essentially are there. And I'm also wondering why the churches take the view that they, and, and seem to have no compunction about this, that they can have discrimination within their organisations and yet seek to discriminate against people in, in, in organisations which they run. Um, it seems to me to be a staggering piece of hypocrisy and I'd uh, appreciate your response. Um, so the major sections of the bill that we've debated today are in response to actual cases. 
So um, the section about state-based anti-discrimination law is in response to the Archbishop Julian Porteous case. Uh, the section about statements of belief is in response to the Israel Folau case. Those are two high-profile public cases which demonstrate staggering overreach, particularly in the Porteous case. Uh, and though there isn't another side of the story that's, you know, really changes the complexion of that. Um, also with the cases we've dealt with, you know, I've been doing this since 2016, we have these coming in all the time. Um, and we don't support people uh, who have got themselves into their own, you know, difficult circumstances, uh, who are to blame. Um, that, that case of the university student, <laughs> that's literally it, he prayed for someone. Um, that's the only thing that was written down uh, in the documents that they sent to him. Uh, that was the only reason given by them uh, for what they were doing. It made someone feel unsafe. Uh, and yeah, I get it that there's... Because he did so, he, with her permission, he did so, like actually did so in a conversation. Uh, well, no. Uh, I mean, look, you can assume that this is far worse than it is. Uh, I mean, far, not as bad as it is, but, but it actually is. They're not marginal cases. We've had nearly 100 of these things. Um, and there's a lot of people out there. If I go to a Christian conference now, and there's 1,000 people in the room, and I speak about this, they come, people come up to me afterwards and say, yeah, look, this is what happened in my workplace. Look, this is what I'm dealing with at the moment. Uh, and the Attorney General and the Prime Minister speak, you know, have spoken to groups that represent these communities and have also seen some of these cases that have come to light, reported in the Australian quite a few just the weekend on Saturday. Uh, there was a number. Uh, and so the cases are very, very real. That's the only reason I support this thing. I mean, I, I think we're fine, except for the fact that I see a rising trend of intolerance and I see this as being genuinely helpful uh, in actually making a statement that bureaucratic elites cannot they cannot target people, pursue them and finish them and end their careers just because they don't like what they're saying. Especially in their private life, which again I say this bill only applies in your private life. It's not about the workplace. I, I think it's, uh, it's interesting that Martin raises the, the Archbishop Porteous case, which I think we're, we're all aware that, that that case didn't go anywhere. In fact, the, 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 the complaint was, was removed. Um, I actually had a different experience. Um, I'd like to call it the patent clause because um, I was taken to task in the Tasmanian anti-discrimination legislation for an ad that was called the Vatican Can um, and it was shown online and um, a Tasmanian took great offence at this and took me to task for, uh, for offending his religious beliefs. Now we went through a mediation process and that was resolved and I actually think that that was a good process and the existing processes are in place. Israel Folau has got numerous other pieces of legislation. In fact, he's in the courts right now without this bill. And he's in there and he's successfully probably um, arguing his case. So, no, I can't see any reason for this legislation except as a sop uh, to various conservative groups because of the Equal... the Marriage Equality Act. All right, time for our other questions because we're getting close to time. Uh, Fiona, do you have another question? Um, look, I, I suppose it is going back to some of those statements that, um, that you say that wouldn't, wouldn't be affected by in the workplace. So I mentioned, you know, making fun of someone for their religious shrine or something like that. So would you adamantly say that at no point should this legislation override any workplace legislation? So any workplace legislation that protects us from bullying in the workplace, um, but it would also uh, temper the speech that this legislation allows. The only piece of legislation in Australia right now that tempers the speech that this legislation allows is Section 17 of the Tasmanian Anti-Discrimination Act, which is the section that you found yourself in trouble with, the section that Archbishop Porteous found himself in trouble with, a section that it seems like we both think shouldn't exist. Um, that is the only... Oh, no, I, I, I felt... I mean, it well, really I don't crazy. think it should exist, because it's crazy. Uh, because words, these are Humpty Dumpty words. They mean, you know, whatever I want them to mean. Offend, uh, bigot, all this kind of stuff, as we've seen. People can allege that over something they severely disagree with, which they don't like having heard, uh, and then that initiates a legal process. And often it's a very private legal process, and we deal with these all the time. Um, and so, uh, that being the case, uh, I, I actually don't know what the fear is, what the concern is. I just don't get it. Um, it sets a more restrictive standard than any vilification law in this country. It doesn't actually in its effect. And by the way, before was said uh, that a statement of belief that occurs in relation to any part of a workplace complaint can't be used, uh, in, a, um, can't be used in a case 
uh, that's brought to an anti-discrimination tribunal or whatever or a court. And it's not quite right because the Act is very specific. It says a statement of belief, note this, cannot constitute discrimination for the purposes of a discrimination law. And so you can use it in anything other than saying that that statement of speech was itself discrimination. And there's no act in Australia except the Tasmanian Anti-Discrimination Act uh, 1998 which would in fact have that effect. So it, it's, it's no problem. 18C? Um, well, racism's not really uh, a controversial thing and it's not really something that Christians believe in. So I'm serious. I mean, that's... That's a well, slur. I think there was a fair few wa wars waged against religion, wasn't there? <clears throat> um, uh, the Crusades were, um, were religious based, and I think certainly when we look at the only time that the, that the Victorian vilification legislation, and this is getting away from discrimination legislation, this is vilification legislation, was when a Christian organisation catching the fire, the churches, Danny Nalia, um, was incited such horror an offence to the Muslim community that the Islamic Council took that ca case to court. And that was the only time that in Victoria where we have seen a vilification legislation come to court. And it was because one religion was saying offensive and inciting um, statements about another. Do you want to respond to that, Martin? Um, well, no, because everything I said still stands. It doesn't apply, it doesn't override any act except the Tasmanian law. So. And have you got another question? Um, yeah, look, I mean, my question is, if, in fact, this act does set a higher standard uh, or a, more restrict, uh, a, a less restrictive standard than the, ta than the, the um, state-based anti-discrimination mm. laws, so if what I said is accurate then, if it does, in fact, have more restrictions on what can be said than the state law, and it only applies outside the workplace, so it doesn't actually apply to people who are in the workplace, um, is that therefore an act that's supportable because it doesn't have the effects that you're concerned about? Yeah, thank, thank you, Martin. I, I think, I think with fundamentally uh, my, my problem is that we have anti-discrimination law in every state in Australia. And that is to, to protect people from being offended, humiliated, ridiculed, intimidated and insulted for various attributed, attributes. So being, you know, as, offended or insulted or humiliated because of their age, because of their disability, because of their gender, um, because of the marital status. And we have those protections in our state legislation. Now this bill absolutely overrides those protections that are afforded in our State Discrimination Act. So this bill says that if you do insult someone, if you do humiliate them, if you do um, offend them uh, on, on the grounds of your religious beliefs, then that does not constitute discrimination. So it, it does override all of our discrimination legislation throughout the country for people with religious beliefs. Um, look, all I could probably do is just quote state-based law, uh, which makes it unlawful to make statements that vilify. Vilify being... That's vilification um, legislation, vilify, Martin, not discrimination. Discrimination legislation doesn't apply to statements. That applies to treatment, not statements, as in someone not getting a job, uh, someone... Uh, you know, this is, this is different. Statements are, uh, are only captured under vilification laws, full stop. I mean, that's the way it is. That's why vilification laws are included in anti-discrimination laws. Um, and the state-based law says that you can't say something uh, that incites hatred, revulsion, severe contempt or ridicule. Uh, this, this law permits statements of beliefs so long as they don't do that and so long as they don't harass or not likely to harass or not likely to do the vilification and so long as they're not malicious and so long as they're in good faith. It sets a more restrictive standard. There isn't an issue. And a discrimination complaint relates to whether or not you can be fired from a job whether or not you can be, have a professional accreditation revoked, whether or not you can be denied accommodation, it doesn't relate to speech. All right, we're going to have to move on, sorry. Our last question, Tim Shaw. Uh, thanks, Sabra. Um, thank you both for your address. Tim Shaw, member of the Press Club Board. It appears to me today that this is swinging both ways, that it, employers are at risk and also employees. Innes Willicks from uh, Australian Industry Group was quoted in the Fin Review today saying, provisions of the bill to be used to advance and protect extremist opinions or behaviour of whatever kind in the name of an undefined religious belief 
should not be underestimated. Can I get you both to comment on that? And to you, Martin, Israel Flower has 135,000 Twitter followers. He follows three people. You're one of them. <laughs> Can you share with us the contact you've had with uh, Israel over the last uh, six months or so? Thank you. Very astute. <laughs> uh, I thought it was quite. A, I was quite privileged to be one of his. You know. Um, uh, so I mean. Israel. Yeah, Israel. I mean, look, um, uh, Israel and I talk from time to time. Uh, we've caught up a few times. Um, uh, all I would say uh, in relation to Israel uh, is that I have found him to be, and this is, I guess this is what's given me a bit more zeal around his case. You know, I went out there on the free speech grounds because uh, I thought it was the right thing to do. Um, but my goodness, he is such a decent, gentle, kind man. Uh, there is nobody who encounters Israel who does not like him. There's a reason why he's never been convicted of bad sportsmanship. There's a reason why there's been no, there hasn't, weren't ever people on the team before this happened that, that had any concerns with Israel and ventilated them publicly. Uh, he's just a nice guy to be in the company of. He's sincere. He's humble. Uh, he, and this is why I find it so grievous, so grievous that, that a guy like him can, can go through what he went through because nobody's asked the bloke what he was doing. Nobody's asked him why he did what he did, what his motives are, what he really thinks. Um, and they can take something without the contextual ballast of somebody's religious faith and how it drives them and makes them think. They can just take the words and they go, I don't like those words and that therefore is bigotry. And for a guy who did what? He spoke. That's what he did. What happened to him was he was fired. He was banned for life. I mean, there's a bloke in the running for the Broncos captain right now uh, who broke into a family home, threatened to kill them, including the nine-year-old son, and now he's in the runnings to be Bronco cap Broncos captain. Israel's been banned for life. He's had his wife targeted. He has GoFundMe targeted. He's had you know, all these things just relentless. And that's what I see that bothers me about this. There's a relentless zeal behind it. And if somebody simply sat down at this table and had a conversation with Izzy, they would find that they had a very different view of the man. And the problem with these laws is they make sure that that can never happen. And they do nothing but fragment, divide and conflict society. And I hate them. I, I would, I would <laughs> certainly imagine that, um, that, that Rugby Australia actually did have much great, deeper conversations with Israel Falau um, rather than just looking at what he said on Twitter and saying, uh, that's it, you're out for life. And it certainly wasn't the first time that he had been counselled about statements that he was making. And this was because they had a code of conduct. The same sorts of code of conduct that you want religious organisations to be able to hire and fire on. So you're saying that it's OK for, they, for you to hire and fire someone on the grounds that they don't maintain your code of conduct. But if, if someone in the secular world um, or a secular organisation has a code of conduct, it's OK for people with religious beliefs not to follow that code. This does not seem fair. This does not seem correct. And I, I, I think if that is the only case, if we are talking about the Israel Folau case, if that is the whole reason for this legislation, then I would go back to my suggestion that we establish an inquiry under the Workplace Act that looks at what is the right of an individual, what is the right of an employee to speak outside, to complain about their employer. Um, we've certainly seen people uh, fired in the media uh, for making statements about Anzac Day. Uh, and they were philosophical, deep beliefs on Anzac Day and they were sacked because of it. So I, I think that this should be a more general question and a more secular conversation about the role that the employer has in um, restricting what an employee says outside the workplace. Like? Just a quick one. Quick one. Okay. I think Fiona and I both have a vested interest in that question that's come up a couple of times, which is, you know, why can you hire and fire people because they have a different view to you in your circumstances? Why is there an exception to the Victorian Equal Opportunity Act for political parties? Why are there exceptions for religious bodies? And it's simply because of this. We make an assumption about organisations who have normal purposes, like sport, like other things, that religion, they should be religiously blind. Religion has no conceivable bearing on sport. It has no conceivable bearing on providing food services. Uh, you know, there's all of these categories that we say, look, that's discrimination to make differences on those things when they're not relevant. That's the key, when they're not relevant. 
There's two key kinds of organisations, but there are others, where their whole reason for existence relates to one of the protected attributes. And to pretend that for them it makes no sense is artificial and ridiculous. Uh, it does make perfect sense because they exist to make political differences and advocate for political causes. They exist to make religious differences and evangelise for religious causes. Those are the two key categories. There are others, don't have time to go into them, but those are the two key categories that make perfect sense because the assumption of, um, of non-discrimination that we usually have breaks down in those circumstances. All right, we're at time. So you each now get a minute and we're turning the order around. So Fiona, you've got a minute to wrap up. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, I think it, it's interesting when you debate when the national secular lobby debates the Australian Christian lobby and we actually find some places where we do agree and and I, I think that's always good to work from those points however there is no reason for this legislation that has been explained to me today I have not seen any grounds for the need for laws to, to treat people with religious views differently from people who don't have those views I would be very concerned if this was um, extended to commercial organisations like aged care and health care. Um, I think that those organisations should be concerned because I, as a, as a member of a state parliament and someone who looks at funding organisations, I would be very concerned funding aged care that had the right to discriminate against someone on the grounds of their religion, their race, their gender, their sexuality. And so I think this legislation should never get passed. Uh, look, I think that one of the concerns really for me is that there is an assumption out there that if you give any kind of freedom to religion, then you must be doing a bad thing because religion harbours all this badness. Uh, if we are concerned ultimately with people's well-being, if we are concerned ultimately with questions of harm in society, if we're concerned with those things, then we will actually promote and permit religion. And the reason I say that is because religion, it's not just the millions of adherents to religion in Australia that will tell you this, and they will tell you, you go to any church, uh, but it is also in fact the vast body of academic literature that shows that religion is good for people on every measure of health and well-being. There is a 2017 meta-study by the Harvard Public School of Health, for example, and that meta-study combines all the research that's out there, and like others that have done this before it, it has made that conclusion. Religious people in this country are the majority of people, and that doesn't, you know, we do protect minorities as well. But I want to remind us of what the public is. This is something that gives them profound meaning. This is something that gives them purpose in life. This is something that, far from embodying shame and all this, it releases them from it. And so to protect this is not on its face a bad thing. It is a very good thing. Thank you. Everybody, please join me in thanking Martin Niles and Fiona Cotton. <laughs> <laughs>